I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, yes, you heard me correctly. I know we're not finished with the year and we've been spending the year in the Gospel of Luke studying a series called Just Jesus where we've looked at Jesus and what he teaches and the people that he interacts with and all of that. And some of you are going, it's still 2016, why are we in Romans? Uh, I'll explain that in just a minute. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,127, and you will find Romans chapter 13. And, uh, and if you need a Bible, you want to read God's Word, and you don't have a Bible, then please take one of these as a gift. Uh, we want you to have the Word of God to be able to read it, because we know if you do that, it will change your lives. So we're, uh, we're looking at Romans 13 because in two days, Americans will go to the polls and make the most important decision in the history of all of civilization. <laughs> Not really. The truth is, I am so tired of the rhetoric and the accusations and the political ads and the mailers and the phone calls and the Facebook feuds, I'm tired of the constant barrage of noise telling us what to think and who to vote for. It, it, it's like, enough already. I am politicked off. <laughs> Anybody with me on that? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, Tuesday will be a glorious uh, release one way or the other. But now, uh, just for the record, if you are a citizen of the United States of America and you are qualified to vote, then you should vote. In fact, how many of you have already voted? See, lots of hands go up. See, I don't know who's going to be at the polls on Tuesday because every service has been like that. But you should, you should vote. We, I mean, we are absolutely privileged to live in the United States of America where we have the opportunity to participate in democracy. So God has given you, as a citizen, influence to use, and you should, by all means, use your influence. Vote your convictions and, and be part of the system. Be part of the conversation. And for the record, because some of you right now are maybe a little bit nervous, I'm not going to tell you how to vote. I'm not going to tell you. It's not my job. It's not my calling. Now, see, I have convictions, and, and uh, I vote my convictions, but if you really want to know what my convictions are, then you just need to take me to lunch, and we'll talk. So, uh, that being said, what I want us to do today is to examine God's viewpoint on the whole election thing. I want us to, to look at Scripture and kind of understand how heaven looks at what's playing out before us and what our part in this is. Um, and it starts with the Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Romans, but who also wrote to the Philippian Christians, to that church in the book of Philippians chapter 3. And he said these words, he said, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's reminding us that, that we are citizens of a kingdom that is beyond this world. So if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, let's make this personal, you believe that he was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then I hope and pray that you want to know what the Bible says about politics because your life is attached to Jesus. You've called him Lord, and so you ought to want to know what his word says. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, then I hope and pray that you'll listen in to what the Bible says because if you're thinking about becoming part of the family of God, then you need to know what, it, what we believe, and this will give you some insight into what God actually says about this. Now, uh, just for the record, and this applies to everything I ever teach, I'm sharing with you my convictions from Scripture. If you don't agree with all of them, I'm okay with that. And if you have questions and, and you say, hey, I, I want to understand this better or that doesn't make sense to me, then by all means email me or even better yet, make an appointment and let's sit down and talk about them face to face because we're all on this journey to know God and to understand Him better and none of us has it all 100% right. So Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, the Apostle Paul wrote these words and he wrote these words while he was in prison. He was in prison because he was falsely accused of causing a riot, and, and, uh, and he also was there before his safety, but he ended up spending at least four years in prison for something he didn't do. And yet he wrote these words. 
Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. I want to share with you three thoughts today that uh, I think are kind of informative about how God is looking at this election season that we're in. Uh, First of all, I would share with you that God is not a member of any political party. God does not endorse any candidate for president. God doesn't support or favor Democrats or Republicans or Greens or Libertarians or Socialists. Uh, For the record, and this may shock some of you, God isn't even an American. I know, it's a surprise. And, and if you're our neighbors from up north, he's not a Canadian either, okay? Just, just saying. You see, Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So he doesn't answer to the President of the United States. It's the other way around. The President of the United States it answers to God. God is way above him. In fact, Scripture makes it really plain when it says, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of that which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus isn't uh, you know, a member of any political party. And don't equate Jesus with a party, unless, of course, it's a wedding party. And if you don't get that reference, then read John chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 19 because there's a couple of wedding parties that Jesus was a part of. Uh, So the kingdom of God isn't about politics. It's about people. Because Jesus wants to claim for himself people of every tribe and language and nation and make them part of his family, part of his kingdom, which is going to last forever. So Jesus doesn't endorse a party or a candidate. In fact, Jesus is looking for people who endorse, support, and serve him. In other words, Jesus is looking for followers, not candidates. Now, a few moments ago, we talked about being a follower of Jesus and what it means. And if you're a follower of Christ, it's way more than just a label you attach to your life. It is a choice that you surrender everything that you are to Jesus and you say, I'm going to follow you, I'm going to serve you, I'm going to believe what you believe, I'm going to adopt your principles. In a sense, I'm going to adopt your platform, Jesus, which is found in this book that we encourage you to read because you're going to inform my life and I'm going to follow you. So Jesus is looking for followers, not candidates. Let me ask you this question. Are you supporting Jesus Or are you asking Jesus to support you and your candidates? Just a thought. Because God isn't a member of a political party. And secondly, whoever God votes for is going to win. Whoever God votes for is going to win. Look again at Romans 13.1. Because the Apostle Paul is really blunt here in a way that, I'll just be honest, makes me uncomfortable. And yet it's true. He says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So according to Paul, who establishes authority? A couple of you got that. Let's try this again. According to the Apostle Paul, Romans 13, 1, who is it that actually establishes all authority? Yeah, God does. He's the one that, that, uh, well, he knows who's going to win the election. He's not going to have to stay up late Tuesday night to find out. Okay, God is the one who institutes authorities. God decides the election. And this is a hard truth. we we got to wrestle with this. Now, it's not really all that hard if your candidate wins. 
right? So if your candidate wins, wins uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, you're like, yeah, God answered my prayers, and my candidate won, and it's awesome. God institutes the authorities, so deal with it. But what happens if the other candidate wins? You know, the one you're not voting for, or the one you're voting against, as the case may be. What happens if they win? Then you're like, yeah, God voted for them, and, and, and it Let's just be honest. It causes a lot of tension because we want to know why. Why in the world would God do that? Why would God let you know, this person rule? Why would God, when they're opposed to the things of God or they don't represent God, why would God do that? Well, reality is God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. And, and there are three possible things that God wants to do through whoever he allows to be in power. Uh, it could be that God actually wants to bless us through our government. That was kind of his original intent. When you read Romans 13, he actually wanted the government to uphold justice and make sure people are safe and make sure that, that there's an opportunity for people to thrive. That's the role of government. So maybe God actually wants to bless us through our government. Could happen. Has happened. And then maybe God wants to actually judge us. Yeah. Actually work judgment on us through government. You go, why would he do that? Well, if you uh, read the Bible, so I encourage you to do that. The Old Testament, the, the first part of it is a story of God revealing himself to his chosen people, Israel. And, and Israel, you know, were the people that God set free out of slavery, established him as a nation so he could tell them who he is, so he could reveal all his truth to them, so that he could usher in Messiah and save the world. Okay, that's their purpose. That's their role. So they knew God better than anybody else. And so, of course, they always did exactly what God said, right? Wrong. They rebelled against God, just like we do, and, and, and they did stuff. And when they, did, when they you know, ignored God as a nation, not just as a couple of people, but as a nation, then God judged them. And he did it through rulers and authorities, sometimes their own and sometimes from the outside. So maybe, maybe whoever God votes for is because we deserve judgment. Or maybe, third option, God is letting the United States of America reap what we have sown. See, we talked about reaping and sowing last week. You're going to reap what you sow as individuals and as nations. And, and we were founded as a nation on godly principles, but we really haven't lived that out, especially in my lifetime. And so maybe, just maybe, as a nation, we're reaping what we've sown, and God is allowing that to happen. So those are kind of three possibilities. But whatever God's purpose, understand God never loses an election. Can't happen. God will accomplish His purposes in this world God will redeem through any circumstances, even when we can't see how he's going to redeem. Has that ever happened in your own life, just personally? Do you ever pray for something? God, I need you to fix this. God, I need you to heal this. God, I need you to redeem this mess that I made. And God answers your prayer, but he doesn't answer it in the way that you wanted him to. Do you ever do that? You ever ask God for something and God gives it to you, but not like you designed? Because most of us not only have a request, but we have a blueprint for God, right? I want you to answer my prayer, and I want you to do it this way, in this time. And, and in my life, God never does it my way. He answers my prayer, but he doesn't answer my way. He doesn't do it in my timing. And sometimes in the middle of it, I'm going, God, what are you doing? Then later on, I look back and go, oh, that's what you were doing. Thank you, God. So if that happens in my life, that happens in your life, what if that happens in our nation's life? Here's what I know. I know there are millions of Christians across this country, maybe a lot of you in this room, that have been praying for uh, America to turn their heart back to God. Praying for spiritual awakening, praying for renewal, praying for revival to happen to America so that the people of America would, would turn to Christ by the thousands, by the millions. It'd be awesome. And, and there would be people who have been praying for this for decades. What if God is actually answering our prayer in ways that we don't want him to? See, because what we want is for God to answer our prayer and suddenly for absolutely no outside reason whatsoever, people wake up and go, I've never been to church. I think I want to go. I've never thought about following Jesus, but now I want to. And, and that's what we want to happen. But again, I, I reference back to the Old Testament. What is it that actually made God's people wake up and pay attention to God? four-letter word called pain. See, usually when God's people were far from him, there would be a famine or there would be some kind of pestilence or usually there was like some invading army that would come in and smash them. And about the time that, you know, somebody else's boot was on their neck, they would go, God, we need you. And God would rescue them. 
And so maybe, just maybe, God is leading our nation to a point of revival. And, and the truth is, we don't like it because we, we want revival without the pain. We've asked God to, you know, heal our land, to turn us back to God. But maybe we're not really on board with how he's going to do that. Just a thought. Something that's been kind of bouncing around my head. So take heart. Because no matter who wins the election, God is in control of the people who are in control. God is in control of the people who are in control. Now, again, some of us struggle to believe this because you look at the world and you look at the evil that's been perpetrated by, by rulers and by governments and you go, how could God allow that kind of evil to happen? Well, pretty much since the garden, uh, since we started rebelling against God's plan, uh, God has allowed us to reap what we've sown and we keep putting you know, evil people in power and we keep doing what evil people say and so evil stuff happens and God never approves the actions of evil men. But God always redeems the actions of evil men. God always redeems what, what people intend for evil. God ends up doing for good. Let me tell you about two real-world, real-time examples of this. Things that were at one point looked like they were horrific, terrible uh, tragedies are now moments of God's glory. The first one is the nation of China. China has been a, officially a communistic atheistic country for 71 years. And, and, uh, and if you go back and read history, a few of you are old enough to have lived it, uh, when, when uh, the communists took over China, they kicked all the Western missionaries out. And there was just a, a handful of believers in Jesus in the country of China. And there was a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth by the, the, all the religious organizations that had sent missionaries to China saying, what's going to happen? And, and especially because the government made it their official goal to turn the entire nation into atheists. And so they tried to stamp out the church. We're going to kill the church. We're not going to have any Christians and stuff like that. Made it illegal for uh, Christians to gather. Made it illegal for people to convert to Christianity. All that kind of stuff. And now 71 years later, after decades of persecution, if not already, it soon will be a reality that there will be more followers of Jesus Christ in the country of China than any nation on the face of the earth. Isn't that amazing? And then just God, he just goes, hey, uh, you, these guys thought they were going to kill the church, and I'm just going to go ahead and blow the church up, make it just take off. See, that, that to me is when you look at this and go, that's not exactly how we would have done it, but it's kind of cool that God did it that way. Or how about this? The nation of Iran. Okay, the day I wrote this message, uh, I was actually reading, and I, I read this article, and I've seen it several times since, uh, so I, I think it's pretty valid. But I read that the Iranian church is the fastest growing Christian church in the world. Now, does that make any sense to you? Because 37 years ago, they started the Islamic Revolution. And again, they kicked the missionaries out. And, and it's illegal for a Christian to share their faith, punishable by death. It's illegal for a Muslim to convert to Christianity, punishable by death. It's illegal for anyone to gather in the name of Christ, punishable by death. And yet, even in the face of all of that, the church of Jesus Christ in the country of Iran is exploding. Does that make any sense to us? No, because God's plans are different than ours, bigger than ours, more powerful than ours, and God is in control of the people who are in control, and God will accomplish his purpose in this world. So we don't have to be afraid, because whoever God votes for will win, and God's going to accomplish his purposes. Third thing I want to share with you, our mission is to expand God's kingdom, not our political influence. Our mission is to expand God's kingdom, not just to gain political influence. Now, here's the reality. Jesus lived in a politically charged time. Uh, a little bit of history. The Romans, uh, you know, the Roman Empire conquered the, the nation of Israel uh, before Jesus was born. It was already under the oppression of Rome. And for about 100 years, the, the Jewish people rebelled. They had started revolts. Uprisings were constant. Uh, so much so that in 70 AD, the Roman emperor had had enough. And so he sent his armies to Jerusalem. They surrounded Jerusalem. They besieged it. And when they conquered Jerusalem, they tore the city apart. I mean, they just ripped down every building, every wall. They shredded it. They said, no one's going to live here. 
We're going to wreck this place. We're going to ruin this place for all time. Jesus was born into that environment. He was raised in that environment. He, was, uh, he worked in that environment. He did his ministry in that environment. And yet, uh, given all that, he almost never spoke to politics. You read the Gospels. Uh, I can find two references to politics, if you will, that, that Jesus said. The first one is, is a... Well, the Pharisees were trying to trap him into saying something stupid, which is not a good idea. And uh, they came to Jesus and they said, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Rome? And Jesus said, show me a coin. They gave him a coin. He goes, whose picture's on the coin? Caesar. And so Jesus said, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar and render unto God what belongs to God. That's statement number one, <laughs> political statement. Statement number two, Jesus is on trial before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. Uh, and, and Pilate, you know, keeps pressing him, saying, hey, are you a king? And Jesus' answer was this, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would be fighting, but my kingdom is not of this world. And by the way, Pilate, because Pilate threatened him, he said, you have no authority over me except that which is given to you from above. He just reminded him, God's the one who gave you the power God can take it away. That's Jesus' po uh, political statements in a nutshell. So since Jesus wasn't talking politics, what did he do? He focused on the mission. Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. I want to seek and to save that which is lost. So because he was focused on the mission, Jesus allowed a corrupt political group to arrest him and hold a mockery of a trial. And then they handed him over to a corrupt politician who, get this, proclaimed Jesus innocent and then had him executed. Why? Why did God allow that to happen? Actually, why did God design that to happen? Because Jesus' job was to pay for our sins. And on the cross, Jesus paid for my sins and your sins. Jesus rescued us from hell. Jesus gave us eternal life. He adopted us into his family by faith. He did all of that because that was his mission. And he was mission-focused, not politically focused. See, the people of Israel, they wanted a political Messiah who would save their nation. We never want that. But Jesus said, I'm going to be the Messiah who will save my people from their sins. So the reality is, no matter who wins the election, God's eternal purpose of changing lives continues. It's the same Wednesday as it will be Tuesday. And our mission, the mission of Calvary, is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And we're going to tell the truth even when it costs us to do so. But here's the thing. If we're going to be effective in that mission, then we be, need to be committed to loving people no matter what. We need to love people whether they are Democrats or Republicans or anarchists. We need to love people whether they are grieving the, the, the results of the election or celebrating the results of the election. See, we just need to love people because Jesus said, look, this is the great commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't say love your neighbor as yourself if you agree with them politically. And by the way, neighbor includes people on Facebook. Really does. You see, no one is ever going to be led to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ by someone who is committed to being a jerk. It's just not going to happen. We can't represent Jesus if we are angry and spiteful and, and vindictive towards half the people in our country. Because, you know, we're kind of divided down the middle. That doesn't make us effective representatives for Christ because we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And if we're going to be focused on the mission of Christ and not just our political agenda, then we have to decide right now we're going to love people no matter what happens in the next couple of days. Because God's power is manifest when his people start loving in crazy, ridiculous ways. 
And that's how God's going to transform this world. That's how God's going to transform this country. So it doesn't matter if times are good or times are bad. It doesn't matter if the economy is booming or if it's collapsing. It doesn't matter if our nation is at war or enjoying peace. Our God and his mission remain the same. I think the psalmist uh, said it best. Psalm 20, verse 7, one of my favorites. Uh, short enough, all of us could re remember it. It'll give you a lot of peace uh, during this crazy time. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in chariots and horses. That was the, the means of power in the time that David wrote this. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And, and, and you put in whatever fits for you in chariots and horses. Some trust in Democrats and some in Republicans, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in the one who's going to win the election or Congress, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some are going to trust in the economy and some in their finances, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in our military might or in the peace of the world, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. So today, are you placing your trust and your hope in a person to be elected president or the living God who saves? You see, I'm going to vote. Truth is, I already have. And I want my candidate to win. But whatever the outcome Tuesday night, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. And this is his world, and we are his people. And we are called by God to make a difference. And we have been entrusted with the good news. And we have been commissioned to love people. All of the people that God brings across your path. I don't know what, about you, but I will trust in the name of the Lord my God. I hope you will vote, and I pray that you will trust in the glorious name of Jesus Christ. Let's pray.